Hello there, Johnny Vanford here, Lorraine County Community College's MEMS and Microelectronics Manufacturing Program and Merit Manufacturing Electronics and Rework Institute for Training. We do a lot of things in our program, manufacturing circuit boards, designing circuit boards, testing circuit boards, but one of the things that we pride ourselves, that we teach our students and trainees on how to do, is how to test and troubleshoot and repair or rework a circuit board back to a functional state. This is kind of a cool thing that we do within our program that ultimately not only teaches the students about how to manufacture the circuit board, how to design the circuit board, but how to get something functional again once it has either been found to be dysfunctional or after years of mal, you know, working in the field that it's become mal, uh, that it's starting to, to function incorrectly. And one of the things that we like to do when we are doing this is to teach students how to determine what the problem is in order to fix it. We start out by teaching the hand dexterity tools so how to use a soldering iron to solder small components, how to use a hot air rework station to lift components off, how to use a multimeter to test a component to see if it's functional, if it's outputting the correct voltage, is the component the correct resistance, does it have the correct voltage load on there. None of that matters though when you are working with something that you don't know what to fix. And that becomes kind of a, 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 a game, if you will, almost. It's almost like a, well, in a lot of ways, it's just the same thing that detectives use when they're trying to solve a crime, right? But in some ways, we're a little bit different since we actually have to do a different style of preparing with something unique to there. Um, and I want to present to you seven steps, Kevin, seven common steps of what it takes to be able to properly test and troubleshoot a circuit board. And I might be leaving a few like very key steps out. I'm generalizing in a great way. A lot of what we teach are just the pure fundamentals. If we were to compare this to a basketball team, I am not trying to teach complex drills. I am trying to teach basic fundamentals that can be carried into the more complex drills and whatnot with it. But anyway, um, the first thing, First and foremost, someone comes to you and says, someone says, someone comes to you and goes, Egads, Mr. Manufacturer, this circuit board is not functional. It doesn't work. There's something wrong with it, right? The very first thing, step number one, verify. Verify that it is dysfunctional. I, I can't tell you from the times I used to work at CompUSA a long time ago, like, 25 years ago in Rockford, Illinois, in the Cherry Valley Mall, and you would get someone that would call you up on the phone, my thing isn't working, and then they bring the thing in, and they bring it up in front of you, you plug it in, and it works, and they're like, well, that's because you're here, well, probably because there was something else more fundamental, like it it had dust in it, or it wasn't plugged in, or you weren't pressing the right power switch to turn it on. Like, who knows with it there? Verify, step number one, verify that it's not working. Because then at least you have a starting point that like, oh, I'm not trying to fix something that's already fixed, right? No one wants to do that. Step number two, document. Take notes, even if it's just a little note, start time little observations with it. You never know. Detectives have to do this during crime scenes. We have to do this when we are trying to fix something. There are some things that we forget. Some people don't have to take notes. Some people, it's a very quick, oh, that found the problem, bam, done, there it is, right? In other cases with it there, it may be somebody else that looks at it a little bit later because you cannot determine what the problem is. And rather than having to relay a bunch of things over to that, take notes, document it. There should be a time sequence. Time is money. It takes time to repair something. It takes time to rework something. And if you are not the only person that's doing it, then it's taking even more time, so make it right. Do the best that you can. You never know when you want to, when you come back, maybe like a day later, maybe after a weekend, you come back, oh, and all of a sudden you have clarity with it. I didn't test for this. And there you go. The third thing, visualize. Look at it, right? Nine times out of ten, there is a problem with some piece of electronic hardware, a circuit board or something like that, and the thing that's wrong with it is very, very obvious. Uh, intuitively obvious in some cases. There exists a philosophy called Occam's Razor. It's very old. It's like hundreds, 500 plus years old, something like that. And it basically states that the simplest solution, the most obvious solution, is often the solution 
for a problem. So look at the simple solutions. If you're looking at a circuit board and there's a giant bug, literally a bug that has crawled into the circuit board and has fried itself on one of the power chips, where do you think the problem is? You know, like it's, it's along those lines there. Let's, let's do an example. Right, so here I've got a circuit board, and this is a relatively simple circuit board that we actually designed uh, for us here. Let's zoom in a little bit and see if we can take a glance. I can kind of explain what it is as it works, actually from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have a USB port, and the USB port also can connect up to these couple of pins that's over here we can connect up to, and through a couple of filter capacitors and a current limiting resistor that acts like a fuse, 5 volts is meant to pass through these devices to it here over to this chip that's over here called a voltage regulator. Now the voltage regulator uses a couple of these resistors to control the voltage coming out of the voltage regulator so that it can go further on down the circuit. This capacitor that's over here helps to smooth out the signal and there's a small LED and a uh, resistor that uh, ultimately uh, lights up when the correct amount of power is being supplied to this chip. Further on down the circuit is a small uh, integrated circuit, a 555 timer, that uses a series of capacitors and resistors to create a timing circuit which outputs a several kilohertz level uh, uh, alternating uh, d uh, uh, DC uh, voltage to three resistors that are in electrical series. A final capacitor helps to make sure that the chip has a smooth signal coming out of the, of the chip. These three resistors that are right here are all in series and create various levels of voltage drops that can be measured using these test points that are over here. This is a circuit board that as when we make this circuit board, we put a few things that are incorrect or try to damage a few components that could be onto it to see what's here. So when I plugged in this circuit board, I discovered that it was not functional. The first thing that I noticed was actually not something over here in the primary function of the circuit board, but I noticed that the LED was not turning on. This indicated to me that there wasn't enough power being delivered into this chip when I didn't see the LED coming on. The LED needs to have a certain amount of power coming into it in order for it to function to it. So I moved my way a little bit further back, and some of you may have actually already pointed this out. You may have noticed, gee, something does not look like it's correct over here. Something, in fact, looks like it has a giant hole coming into the top part of this capacitor. And this capacitor, which is a filter capacitor right here, it's meant to prevent uh, large amounts of electricity from going further down the circuit, has completely blown into a shorted state. This capacitor is missing several pieces of it on the inside. It is burnt. The outside parts of the circuit board are actually slightly burnt. It's hard to tell with the light in terms of what it is. And when I measure this capacitor electrically, it measures as a, as a short circuit, which capacitors really shouldn't do. So rather than have to go through a whole bunch of diagnosis on this particular part of the circuit board and measure this and this and this and write my name down here, or whatever, right? All I looked at was, ah, there is a blown component on this circuit board. And if I replace this component, the entire circuit board will function as it is. Occam's razor, at its finest, the simplest solution is most often the solution to the problem. In this case, something that's burnt with a piece missing from it, voila, problem solved, and I could charge someone $150 saying I solved the problem with it. Yeah, so that's an example of step three. Step three is very much so just look at it. Sometimes the problem is very obvious. Now, that's not to say that that's the same thing every single time. Although, a great many cases, especially in factories that are manufacturing the circuit boards, there are three very common problems of electronic components that have everything to do with mechanical connections to that part. Either the part is missing solder, has too much solder that it's bridging and touching something else, or it has moved or shifted or is to the point where it's just not even present in the first place. Now all of a sudden, you have three me total mechanically related objects in terms of what's happening that represent 60% of all of the defects that occur on a manufacturing line of circuit boards after the component is made. 60% of all the defects have nothing to do with how it electronically works.
right? And there's actually even another 30% of those defects, which can occur because it is the wrong part or the part is in the wrong polarity. It is rotated incorrectly with it. That has nothing to do with the electronic function. It's not like a chip shorted out or something like that. Now, granted, there's another 10% that does have to do with electrical problems with it, which it leads me into the fourth step of this whole thing. What moved? What got touched? And do I have to do anything in terms of, like, being able to, uh, 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 to look for something that is, like, somewhat uh, 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 touched by humans? Maybe that's the right way to phrase it in terms of what that is. All right. So, yeah, there may be something else that's wrong with it. What is present to the environment? Right? Where can moisture get in? Where can a bug crawl into it? Where can... can warm air seep into it? Or most importantly, where can I, as a human being, interfere with the operations? Raise of hands. How many of you have plugged the wrong wire into the socket at some point? Oh no, I have this micro USB-C. I was plugging in a, an Apple wire or something like that, you know? That happens from time to time. We're human beings. We make mistakes. Look for what the human is in contact with. Look for something that got touched by a person or by the outside environment. Something that could have leaked, had something water spill onto it, something like that there. Look for rust or, or some sort of water stains, water rings with it somewhere in the inside. Little dried up bits of water or something like that. The fifth part, got to know your electronics. There is a certain chance that there may be something wrong with it. The use of a multimeter is ultimately extremely important. How to measure voltage how to measure short circuits within the circuit, how to measure open circuits within the circuit. Current, yeah, the only current, I know they teach this. Every electrical engineering school in the nation teaches this within their first classes. This is how to break a circuit open so that you can measure current. None of us do that in the practicality, all right? None of us want to break a circuit further than what it's already broken. We need to understand what is actually there. The only current that we typically care about in terms of trying to get something fixed is the amount of current that's supposed to be regulated to the entire thing. If there's more than that much current going to it, then there's something deeper wrong with it on the inside. We can diagnose via voltage. Voltage is the one that will always matter with it. Resistance, if it's a low resistance and you're measuring a short, like less than 10 ohms, now nah, you're probably okay. But if you're trying to measure like accurate resistance or measure accurate capacitance of something that's in the circuit, that won't work all the time. You sometimes have to remove that component from the circuit board in order to get a proper measurement in terms of what it is. And that type of testing leads to a little bit more of like a, you need something very specific in order to understand what that is, which means you're going to break the circuit further, which in repair is just not what we do. Rework? Maybe. Maybe we're trying to test a circuit board out to understand a little bit more with that. Maybe we need to measure current and larger amounts of resistance, capacitance, inductance, all of that in some way. But if I'm just trying to get something that's way beyond its warranty working again, I just care about how much current's being delivered to the entire circuit. I don't want to break the circuit any further than what it's already broken when it came to me in the first place with it, right? Which means I'm measuring voltage, I'm measuring continuity for shorts and opens, and that's it. That's like what I have to really go by in terms of what's there. But also how to read a schematic, how to understand the strange symbolic art form in terms of like how to read a, an actual schematic in terms of, uh, of what it is. I walked you through that circuit earlier in terms of what, uh, how that circuit functions. There's a whole schematic that looks way, way different than how that circuit's actually laid out. Mostly that it can go from left to right with it there. It seems like when I built it, I actually built the circuit top to bottom with it. But anyway, anyway, the, uh, the, the whole point is like to be able to read the artwork with it. A lot of people, they try, try to say reading schematics is easy. It's not. It, it's absolutely not. It takes time, it takes practice, and it takes an understanding to be able to know the symbols with it there. Which, that's probably one of the hardest things that we study is the art of the, the uh, artistic interpretation of the schematic in terms of what it is. Well, also its technology function. Then, step number six, repair and rework it. How to use a soldering iron properly. How to use the hot air rework station property. Fluxing agent is our friend. We like flux. It helps protect the circuit board parts around it. It helps make a good solder joint. The understanding of Rojas materials, restriction of hazardous substance materials, right? Rojas materials means lead-free materials, which there's a lot of products that are made with that these days, especially anything that's going to be in contact with us human beings. Repair people have a hard time sometimes with lead-free based stuff. We like to use lead 
it's carcinogenic, it's got problems with it, yeah, but at the same exact time, this thing's eight years out of warranty, and someone just wants to get it working so they can get their pictures off of whatever it is, so they can get a new one anyway with it, right? So the understanding of how to do the hot air rework, how to do the soldering, the dexterity that's required, the metallurgical understandings, the material understandings for it, and the idea not to burn the circuit board beyond what it's already you know been burnt up to be able to do, right? Finally, step seven, verify the fix. Right? Don't just hand it back to them and be like, ah, sure, it works. Like, no, check to make sure that the LED turns on. Check to make sure that the circuit board actually is functional in terms of what that is. I shouldn't have the time to do that with the circuit board that, I'm, that I showed you on the camera with that there. Maybe that'll be a second video in terms of what we do. Right? We'll make that a, a, a part two associated with this video. But yeah, seven steps to troubleshooting, testing and troubleshooting circuit boards. Verify that you had, you, you know, test your board. Is it actually broken? Two, document the entire way along the way. Three, visualize. Look for the obvious things that are wrong. Four, where the human interacts with it. Look there. Look where the power is, right? If the circuit's not getting power, which is usually where a lot of problems lie is within the power circuitry, then there you go. You don't have to go deeper into all the microelectronics and the RAM and the processor. If there's something wrong with the power. If none of it's getting power, well, then it doesn't matter anyway. Put it there. Five, understanding electrical testing and schematics. How to use a multimeter, oscilloscope. Very, very important. Six, how to do rework and repair using soldering irons, hot air rework stations, and other tools that are available. That, that's just the ones that we teach within the program. And then verify that the fix actually worked. All of that... You got that all down, you're going to be a good microelectronic manufacturing detective, is what you'll be. All right, thank you very much. Hey, let me know in the comments down below. Am I off? Am I on? I'm, I'm teaching this, so I mean, like, I assume that this is kind of coming with this here. But let me, let me know. Let me know in the comments down below. Uh, and uh, we will see you around on the next one. See you later. Bye-bye.